again. They said it couldn't be done. They said it wouldn't last. White man, black man, America F1. America F1, coming to you straight from San Francisco, California. Sherman Tillman, Michael Lawler. America F1. Welcome to another episode of America F1 with co-host PJ Feminia. Mike's in Thailand, so hope he's having fun over there. Today we're going to talk about the Shanghai Grand Prix. They haven't been to Shanghai in five years at the Shanghai International Circuit. And there's some racers who've never been in this race, right, PJ, who've never raced at this circuit? Yeah, we got Oscar, we got Yuki, we got Joe, we got Logan. So a lot of people, a lot of guys have not raced this track ever. And it's supposed to be a sellout crowd. Now remember, this is the first weekend for the sprint race. And do you like sprint races? Unpopular opinion. I actually like the sprint races. For some reason, I don't know what it is. I watch all the podcasts and pundits and like, oh my god, sprint races sucks. They're horrible. They're just <laughs> cash <laughs> money. It's all about the cash. The money. It's so horrible. Like what? Like it's more racing. It's fun. It's like it's you know it's 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 MotoGP does has been doing sprint races too, and they're fun. They're really fun to watch because like they you just people just go on the soft tires, no pit stops, just go for it. You know. It's a lot of, to me, it's entertaining. I like the sprint race, and I'll tell you why I like it. Because, and I've said this before, probably three, four months ago, no one wants to watch practice. Okay? When you go, all right, when you go to a race, the first day is practice, and hopefully they'll have, like, you know, uh, another race like a GT race or sometimes they have Ferrari, they have Porsche cars, maybe they'll have F2, F3, which would be great if, if you get to go to a weekend where you get to see F2 and F3 because that's more racing you get to see and usually F3 or F2 they crash so there's a little bit more excitement and I think in F2 the racing is a little bit closer together so you get, you get to see a little bit more passing and such but if it's an ordinary weekend, and I say ordinary because no Formula One race should be ordinary. Every Formula One race, like Lewis Hamilton says, should be like the Super Bowl. You know, you're coming to some town. The only time you're coming to that town, it should be like a Super Bowl. It should be like a huge event, right, for the city. But when you go to the race and there's practice one and practice two, it's boring, man. It's It's, it's boring. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I don't watch practice at all. I don't watch FP2, FP1, FP3. It is very boring. Yeah, nobody wants to watch that. And the ratings, and it proves in the ratings, the ratings on television when they have practice one and practice two, they go down dramatically comparatively to when they have a sprint race. And so, you know, everyone complains about, oh, I don't like the sprint race. We don't get... You know, we don't get enough time on the track. We don't get enough practice. We don't get enough uh, data to check out the tires and where the sweet spot is and blah, blah, blah. It's about the fans and they keep forgetting. I think Formula One, to me, out of all the sports that are out there, they're the ones that forget about the fans, man. They just think the fans are going to come and the fans are going to keep paying more and more and more money. And it doesn't matter what kind of product we put out. They're just going to show up. <sighs> right. If they really want, if they really cared about the fans, they would do something about Red Bull. But that's a topic for a different video. <laughs> well, it's true. They did. They they did. Remember, they were doing something about Mercedes. You can't do this wing. Right. You can't uh, do this floor. Right. I, I, yeah, I watched. I think a video about that recently, where during the Mercedes domination era, and even the Ferrari domination era, they were FAA was actively trying to, you know, stop the domination was they've done nothing at all to stop the Red Bull domination. Nothing at all, which goes to, to all the people with the conspiracy theories. It goes to all the people saying that it's a Red Bull FIA. It goes right toward that. And really there's nothing else they can say because you go by what people do, not what they say, but let's get right into our Shanghai preview. 
What do you expect, PJ, from this race? And are you really looking forward to the Shanghai International Circuit this weekend? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm actually excited to see this track because I haven't seen the new cars on this track. So we have no idea what it's going to be like. I don't know what the qualifying time is going to be like and all that. Um, for the sprint race, I predict this is a delusional take, but Carlos Sainz to take the sprint race. Max Verstappen P2 and then Charles Leclerc P3 in the sprint. And then for the real Grand Prix, I'm going to go Max Verstappen P1, Carlos Sainz P2. And Charles Leclerc P3. Okay. I don't really care about who finishes what in the sprint race. It doesn't matter to me. I just like to watch the sprint race. It doesn't matter. I I don't, I don't put any credence or, Ooh, you won a sprint race. You know, Oscar won a sprint race last year. So, I mean, who, who cares, but it's good to watch for the fans. It's good for the fans who are on the track. But as far as the race I'm going with, of course, I mean, how can you not? I mean, if you just went with Max Verstappen every race, you'd probably be right 90% of the time. So I'm going to go with Max again. But this time in P2, I'm going with Charles Leclerc. And I think Charles Leclerc, even though I think Carlos Sainz has been in great form, I think some of the tracks haven't suited Car- I mean, Charles Leclerc's driving style so far. And he's been in kind of a funk because the car is actually better than last year. And I was reading that for some reason, he hasn't really connected with this year's car yet, even though it's a better car. You know, I think it it's like a sunny day and we love sunny days. Right. And then one day you wore your favorite tennis shoes. And for some reason, they didn't feel as good as those old tennis shoes that you have you just bought these new ones and they just didn't feel as good and so you kind of got to get used to that new tennis shoe feel i think it's the same thing with this car for for charles leclerc it's a it's a new car it's a brand new car it's better than last year's car but he just doesn't have that hometown feel and fit with it yet you get what i'm saying pj yeah i just i just feel like as well carlos is just in a better form right now than than charles is it more that he has more to prove because you know he he's looking for a seat next he still doesn't have a seat next year i mean technically the guy is unemployed next year we all know he's going to get a seat but technically he's unemployed so he has more things to prove like charles already has a long-term contract with ferrari and for all intents purposes he'll probably be a ferrari drive his whole career you know Right, yeah, he has more to prove, and I just, I've been saying this since last year, like, he, he it was just on the form of his life, and like, you know, Monza and Singapore last year, I feel like that was the true Carlos Sainz that, like, I knew was there, and he's just been showing that this entire season. Well, everybody knows, if you watch this show, I'm the biggest Carlos Sainz fan. I've been saying it over and over again, put respect on that man's name, I was saying it before, he started winning all these races. He had only win. He had only won one race. And I was saying, I see something in this guy. I like the feedback that he gives to his uh, engineer when he's in the car. I like how when his engineer gives him something that he doesn't like, he just tells him, no, I'm not doing that. And that gives shades of Alonzo. That gives shade. I'm not saying he's on Alonzo's. No, no, don't, don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying he's on Alonzo's uh, par, but I'm saying he gives the same type of feedback that Alonzo, Hamilton, Vettel, the greats, that they say, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. We're going to do this. And he's one of the younger guys that I hear. Norris does it all the time, but a lot of the times Norris is wrong when he does it. Like when when he that one race, the rain race, when they told him he should come in for tires, and he was like, no, it's perfect. He was 100% wrong about that, and he would probably won his first race. But I digress. He is one of the young drivers that gives good feedback on the track. Yeah, he he's you know he's he's the whole package when it comes to that. He he can he can you can do his own strategy from the car. He doesn't even have to listen to what the clowns or Ferrari are saying. He can just <laughs> he can just read the track, read the situation, and just come up with the strategy on the fly. And it usually. Nine times out of ten, it, it always seems to work. Yeah, it, it does seem to work. It's, I mean, I think 
a lot of people are saying, and they shouldn't say it. Oh, why? You know, now how does Ferrari look? The Carlos Sainz looks great. Now look, look at Lewis Hamilton. He doesn't look so great. Why would they want to do? Stop, stop, just stop. Okay, stop. Because we're talking about Lewis Hamilton, and then we're talking about Carlos Sainz. Now, Lewis Hamilton, compared to anybody else on the grid, is here. Why is he here? Because people who don't know about Formula One know who Lewis Hamilton is. Only people in Formula One and people who live in Spain know about Carlos Sainz. That is the difference. Lewis Hamilton can sell tennis shoes. He can sell socks. He can sell hats. He can he can sell everything. He can sell ice cubes if you wanted to. And people will buy it. Carlos Sainz, you have to be a Carlos Sainz fan to buy his merch. When people think of Ferrari, if you go to the go to the race, go you people stop talking from your damn couch. Go to the race. Charles Leclerc merch is purchased more than Carlos Sainz merch. Probably easily three to one. Like you go to Charles Leclerc merch, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone fast. You could be after the race. And when I say after the race, because most of the merch goes on the first day, most of the merch goes on Thursday or Friday. It's gone. You know, most of the good stuff. And then you got to get, you know, the after effects on on Saturday and Sunday. But after the race, most of the stuff is gone. There's still be Carlos Sainz merch still there, PJ. I did not know that because I've never been to a race. So I got I to gotta go to Vegas this year. See this for myself. Now, other than the top, other than your predictions, give me some. Who fill out that grid? What what's All Lewis right, Hamilton right. going to do? What what about you know? What, what are some of these other races? Is George going to outperform him again? What, what's going to happen down the grid? What about right, McLaren? So, my... so it was Max, Sainz, the clerks. So let's start. Let's let's go from P twenty to. To G four here. All right, so Stone Cold last. I'm gonna put dun dun dun, dun Logan Sargent. Will he crash? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, it's, for me, it's either it's last or or it's a DNF. That's what I'm gonna go with. Okay. So All right. All right. P nineteen. I'm gonna go Valtteri Botas because oh, fake is absolutely. Oh no, Valtteri. You mean Zhao's going to finish not, ahead of Valtteri? I think Joe will get a boost from being at home and get a little bit better. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to go with the Alpine Tractors, P18, Pierre Gasly, <laughs> P, P17, SN Ocon, and then P16, Joe. Okay. All right, and then P15, I'm going to go Alex Albon. Uh, then P14, I'm going to go Daniel Ricardo. P13, Kevin Magnuson. P12, Nico Hulkenberg. P11, to me, this is a really tough one. It's either Yuki P11 or like Lance Stroll P11 for me. And then like, the, you know, the, the last point is either Yuki or Stroll. Well, I like that. I like I like how you did that. I'm gonna go with last place being Logan Sargent. I mean, you can't you 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 literally can't go wrong with picking Logan Sargent last. It's an unfortunate so I, thing. I'm so disappointed in Logan Sargent, man. I, I, I had so much hopes for him going into his you know his start, and then he turned out to be. Like one of the worst drivers we've seen in Formula One, in modern Formula One. Well, I mean, obviously Mazel Spin was worse. Um, he, he's probably the, the worst of late. Um, but Logan's unfortunately, he's an American, and I hate to talk about my fellow Americans, but he's pretty bad. He's had one good race where it was Austin 23. He had a, you know, that was a glimmer. Where you're like, oh, okay, this is a good race for him. He might have something here. But no, he was inconsistent in F2. And he's been way more inconsistent in F1. And I think it has to do with 
He's just not a good driver. When you look at if okay, if you have F1 TV, you can follow each driver. And I do this from time to time just to see how I, I mean, I follow my favorite drivers, but I, I do it from time to time just to see the input on the steering wheel what different drivers do. And if you look at the top drivers, if you look at Lewis's steering wheel, if you look at Max's steering wheel, if you look at Alonzo's steering wheel, there's not much input. They're not moving and fighting the car at all times. There's just little fine movements. If you look at Logan's steering wheel, which unfortunately I took the time to do and it was like I wanted to I won't say I wanted to hang myself, but I was pretty close. it was so boring but he just there's so much input on the wheel there's so much movement on his steering wheel he's fighting the car all the time and i don't know if it's the car or him and then to Compare, I say, okay, well, I can't just watch this guy. Let me go to Alex's Albon's uh, feed and let me see how his input is. Dramatic difference. Like, dramatic. Like, I'm sure these guys look at each other's telemetry, but maybe the <laughs> for Logan, he needs to look at the input that he's doing on the steering wheel. It's just way too much. And it just shows the difference. And Alex Albon, he's not a top-tier driver, but I think out of the young guys, he's a good driver. And I think he's super reliable and he's fast and he's quick, especially in qualifying. It, it's night and day. He's just a better driver and it's not even close. Yeah, just, man, like, um, oh yeah, go, going back to like Austin 2023, he only scored a point because Lewis and Charles got disqualified. That yes. was like not a, you know, never scored a point on pure merit. No, never. He never scored a point on clear merit, but he did have a, a a good drive where he didn't spin out. He had a drive where he didn't go off. He had a drive where he was consistent, and that was the one shining moment so far. And I don't think one shining moment in two years is enough to continue as a Formula One driver, especially with the crashes. There's just too much, too many crashes. And we'll, we'll talk about that on our other segment, which we're going to talk about the other side of Formula One. We're always talking about racing and who's the best and how this guy is not as good and blah, blah, blah. But let's start talking about what the teams are doing and behind the scenes. But as I finish my um, predictions, I, don't, I, 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 I think you after Logan Sargent's last. I'm going to go with either Gasly or Al or Ocon for 19 and 18. Just because that car is such a dog, it's probably one of the worst cars that, you know, Alpine or whatever, all their different iterations of names have ever made. The car's overweight. We'll talk about that later, but it's a dog of a car. I feel sorry for both of those drivers. Even though I'm not a big Ocon fan, he is a Formula One driver, and I think he's a a good solid I think both of those guys are good solid Formula 1 drivers I don't really see um because they both won Formula 1 races and once you win a race that just says that especially in a midfield car that says that you're a good driver to me you're in a midfield car you win a race you're a good driver period end of story I don't want to hear any excuses about it I don't want to hear about oh well, the sun r- rose over here on that day and it was wet on this part of the track on that day no they won Period. End of story. I mean, what do you think about that, PJ? Yeah, I think I think as they all are like way better than people give them credit for. Because like it's like you said, they both they both won a race. And I remember watching the Alcon win the race live, and I was just blown away. I like no one expected that. Yeah, it's like the, those guys, they they don't deserve the absolute dumpster of a car that they have right now. Their, their talent is way better than that. Yeah. I agree 100%. They deserve a better car. And I would almost say if it wasn't a French team that they should go and find find somewhere else to drive because Alpine, just I don't know if it's the French ownership, and I don't know. All I can go by is what I see and what I read and the feelings that I get. And 
they don't have stability at Alpine. People leave in droves every year to get new personnel. You have to have stability. You have to have continuity in any business and organization. And that's what they don't have. And that's probably why they fail. Anytime you look at a business, no matter what it is, sports, shoe shining, it doesn't matter. Consistency has to be the key. Even our, on our, take our Formula One channel here. Consistently. We do a show, we do a show, we keep going, we keep going, we keep going. And eventually we'll find a, a bigger audience and eventually we'll find our, our little niche in this Formula One world. But it's all about consistency. Like you know we're going to do a show every week. Period. End of story. Now, we, you might not know what day it's going to come out. It might come out on a Wednesday. It might come out on a Tuesday. We're not at that consistency level because both of us still work and Mike works. and We're all still working. This is not our only job like some of these other people who this is what they get paid to do. So it's a lot easier to be more consistent on what day and what time you're coming out. But having said that, at Alpine, droves of engineers leave every year. And I do not droves. I don't mean like one or two. I mean droves leave. Droves of people leave Alpine. The PR people, the behind the scenes people, the you know the the guy who puts on the tire warmer, the guy who puts up the jack. It's just ridiculous. And they always firing principals there. Always. When's I mean? When, where's the consistency? And so. For Gasly and for Ocon, if you have all this chaos going on around you, you got to focus also. And so it's hard. You're working with one engineer one year and the next year you're working with another engineer. And the next year, hey, this guy takes care of your needs for PR or or she takes care of your. And now it's a new PR. Per- How do you get any continuity? How do you develop a relationship? And business is about relationships. And I can go to PJ and I can say, hey, what do you think about this? And PJ say, oh, well, I think it's this way or I think it's that way because you build a relationship and then you build on that. And that shows up on the track. Would you agree or not agree, PJ? I do agree. I, that team, they just don't know what they, they just keep blaming the problem on like personnel when there's a fundamental issue in the management of that team like the upper management, it's not just, they can't just keep pointing the finger at someone. Like they, they point, like they pointed the finger at Otmar when he was definitely not the problem. Like he, Otmar, in my opinion, actually improved that team. They just totally got rid of him for just, for just like nothing basically. Cause like, oh, there's a couple of DNFs and there's, you know, kind of a couple of poor qualifyings, but no, he got that team. Like you got that team P4, the constructors. I think that shouldn't be overlooked. Not only should it not be overlooked, how do you how do you fire a guy who gets your team to P4 who did who didn't even deserve to be P4? Give me a break. I mean, you got you got Mercedes, you got McLaren, you have Ferrari, you have Red Bull. So those are supposedly the four top teams, but now you have Aston Martin. So that's five top tier teams that have a lot of money and you manage to finish ahead of two of them or one of them and now you want to fire that guy i mean come what what yeah because that, yeah. that that's just in just they just immediately because i think it was because they had two double dnfs but that wasn't Otmar's fault. It was just honestly bad luck. And they're just like, oh, because we're not scoring points. It must be your fault. And then they just they got rid of Otmar. And that was a really, really dumb decision. Hey, even um, Tom Brady had a bad game. Even Michael Jordan, you know, had a bad game. I mean, no matter who you are or what you do, you're going to have a bad day. Period. End of story. You just got to get back up off off the floor. And keep on trucking and keep on moving. And so this guy, the team had a bad day. So instead of just picking yourselves up and learning from that as an experience, they say, oh, let's fire him. And that's why Alpine 
is the dumpster fire that they are. We'll get more to them. Let's get back to our preview of Shanghai. And sometimes, you know, we, hey, if we come up with a subject and it kind of goes off on a tangent, that's just part of the business. We're going to, we're going to pursue it. You know, why it's hot on the fire. I think now I said I had Alpine, what, 18 and 19, 19. Then I'm going to go with Zhao. Then I'm going to go with Valtteri. And then I'm going to go with the Haas tandem. I don't know which one will finish ahead of each other because they've both been kind of you know racing. I mean, Hulkenberg's ahead of Magnussen, but Magnussen's been showing some pretty good race pace of late. So I don't know. I'll, I'll make a prediction. I'll go Magnussen and Hulkenberg. And then getting around to that 10th, you made a good point about um, – Albon and would it go to Stroll? I think Stroll will have a comeback. I'm actually thinking Stroll will get that point on 10. And according to how the Mercedes show up, hell, he might even beat Hamilton or Russell, to be honest. Because I think that the pace of that Aston Martin, obviously, by looking at Alonso, is pretty good. Yeah, for me, so I was at I was at P eleven P ten. I'm gonna go with I, I want Yuki to score on the point. I guess Yuki P eleven, then Stroll P ten, and then I'll go. I think Mercedes will be yeah. Like I think Russell P nine, Lewis P eight. Sadly, yeah. And I, then, I uh, agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, Mercedes has been just dog shit lately. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I'll go with McLaren. I'll go with Oscar P7. Lando. No, I'll go Fernando P, P6. And then Lando P5. Checo, and then Checo P4. And then my top three, I already said that earlier. Charles Sainz and then Max. Yeah, I'm going to go with Max, Charles, and... <sighs> You know what? I'm gonna go with Max, Charles, and Alonzo. That's what I'm. That, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm going with that. I'm going with Max, Charles, and Alonzo for this race. And then after them, then it'll be Science or Checo. And you know, I don't know which one will, will go. They can. They can. It, they can flip flop. I think Checo's been driving driving his ass off so far this year. He's super consistent. And I don't like that other people are trying to give away his seat. Stop doing it. Because, you know, Max doesn't want the competition. But not only that, he's driving well. And they've won every year that he's been on the team. So why would you switch it? Yeah, uh, uh, people keep saying, oh, my God, like, science needs to go to Red Bull. Like, as a science fan, I'm like, fuck no. Like, that would be the worst move for him to go. Like, that's such a bad place for science to be because, like, he would have to 100 percent be the number two. He'd get he wouldn't be he wouldn't be allowed to like fight Max. So just no. And Checo has been doing enough to secure that seat anyway. So what? Don't even you know, like don't even give away that seat like you just said. Not only that, but if you did for whatever reason, you have to change at Red Bull. It has to go to Yuki because. I've said it before. I'm getting. I'm actually getting frustrated with saying it. Yuki's a good driver, and he deserves it. I mean, what else do you have? What else does the guy have to prove? You put Tom, Dick, and Harry in the seat, and he beats all Tom, Dick, and Harry. So if if that's what you want, then he deserves to get a promotion because he's beaten all the people that you put against him. So what else is the guy supposed to do? Now here's where I think. Max doesn't like that competition. He doesn't want Carlos Sainz in the car. He definitely didn't want Alonso in the car. You know he didn't want Hamilton in the car. And there's something to be said about having team continuity and no no trouble. That's why he likes Checo. Because he knows he can beat Checo. Checo will win a couple races a year. Everyone's happy. Leave it at that. And that's why Mercedes screwed up. Because they brought on Russell... When everything was fine with Valtteri, just leave Valtteri. He was happy. He went a couple races a year. 
Lewis will get the majority of the points and everybody was happy. But when you bring in another top tier driver, there's going to be issues. Period. Yeah, we saw that with, uh, you know, Rossford over the years. It's always going to be when there's two really good drivers, it's always, a, you know, a boiling point. Yeah. And will there be anything that we haven't seen so far up till now in this race? Like, is there going to be some big surprise? Like, that's what Formula One needs right now. Like, we're, uh, Carlos Sainz win was a breath of fresh air, but he only won because Max DNF. If Max races the whole race without any issues, can anybody beat Max for stepping? I think there's only one person that can. I think it's Carlos Sainz right now. I think he's, I think he's the second best driver on the grid right now. As we speak? Yeah, I think, yeah as we speak, I think he can on merit, on pace. If the car it has to, the car has to be right, obviously, but if the car is there, I think he can beat Max on pure merit right now. I, I would say I think Ch- Charles could do the same thing, but I don't think Charles can. I don't know what it is about him. There's something about the pressure. I mean, he's won races, so you can't really say. But for a guy who's, I think he has 23 or 24 P1 qualifiers, and he's only converted. He's only had five white race wins. So that's a pretty huge disparity. I think if you look at the other guys who have won races and qualify P1, their conversion rate's probably 90%, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think he has one of the worst pull-to-win ratios of any driver, I'm pretty sure, in history. Yeah. If not the worst. I know that Carlos has a better pull-to-win ratio than him. Um Obviously, Max does, like, Lewis and all those guys. But that's – Charles, Just he's unlucky. I don't know, it's not going to say it's his fault because it, it, most of the time it isn't. It's just Max having a better car. But there has been times where he has, like, crashed, you know, out of first position or DNFs. But, a lot of, you know, like I said, it's bad luck. But, for example, in France, 2022, that was all him. He just crashed right into the wall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I I agree. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't think it's pressure, but he makes mistakes at critical moments, and maybe that's another reason they're bringing Lewis on because Lewis has been there, done that. He's trying to win his eighth, but he's also friends with Charles, and he probably can help him out in some certain areas. I mean, he has so much experience, and that's why I think – that's where George is lacking because George is, you can tell, 100% he could care less what happens to the team as long as he's ahead of Lewis. That's all he cares about. And I think he's missing out on all the other attributes that he could learn from Lewis. And what I've noticed, and they're talking about, oh, well, Lewis has been trying out these different parts and he's been trying out different modes and qualifying and blah, 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 and practice, blah, blah. My question would be, why isn't Russell doing that? He's the guy you want to lead the team, right? Why are you having Hamilton do all that stuff? He did that two years ago. You know, he's been doing that for this dog of a car all the time. Why don't you put some of that load on Russell's shoulders? Unless they know that Russell's not the guy. And that's why they've been trying to get... You know, that's why they were trying to get Alonzo. That's why they've been trying to get Max. That's why they're trying to get Carlos Sainz. They're trying to get somebody else really to lead the team because they feel that George is not capable of leading that team. What do you think about that, PJ? George, he's got talent, but he has another issue similar to uh, Charles where he is a, he's accident prone, crash happy, but like, yeah, he's he's just like Charles in that sense, where he, he always seems to find a way to crash either into somebody else or to find himself in the wall like in critical moments. During the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka, he was trying to pass Oscar Piatri. He oh, tried yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Now he was trying to there was one turn he tried to pass him on. 
and he basically it was on a turn and he was trying to go wide but there was nowhere for Oscar you can't take that turn really to a breast and there's really nowhere for Oscar to go and he kind of pushed Oscar off out of the way and then Oscar got the position back but it just showed the race craft like one why are you trying to pass there and then two where if you're going to try to pass there then you should pass but he just lost time he just lost position and then what could have happened well he didn't lose position he stayed in the same position but what could have happened is a dnf you could have took both guys out or you could have took yourself out why pass there when you can just wait for the drs and just pass him on the straight like he eventually did but that's the race craft. That's the thinking ahead. That's okay. I got this guy. I'm just going to buy my time and get him in the right way. Or when I get him, I can put some space in between us. You pass him right there on that turn. Say you would have passed him there. Then he's just going to catch you again on the DRS, man. <laughs> it just didn't make any sense. I'm sitting there watching it going, what's wrong with this guy? Like, hasn't he raced enough not to know this stuff by now? PJ? Yeah, I was, dude, I was dying when I saw that. Shit was cracking me up because, like, he, he just goes into that turn. He fucking dive bombs Oscar and then, like, barely, basically, like, bumps him off the track. Oscar's like, whoa, like, has to, like, you know, take evasive action to, like, avoid having a massive accident with George. And then, like, George gets started. And then it's funny because then the commentator is like, oh my God, he's going to go on the radio to complain about George. And he does. But, like, <laughs> Oh, he's so predictable, right? He, you know, and then he went, I guess we did. He went on the radio to complain, like, bro, that was all you. You didn't do anything. You literally almost just killed him. And he's in a fucking, and he goes on the radio to complain, oh my God, you turned into me. Like, ah, like, what was that? Like, what? And then, then he gets on, then he goes on the straight, and then he gets the DRS and he swings, like, way to the left. I'm like, whoa, like, why do you need to do that? And, like, you know, was he kind of like lost control of the car, how violently he swung to the left to pass Oscar? I'm like, dude, this guy. Like, what am I watching here? But yeah, I was cracking up about that. Yeah, I, I I know. So, I've been right about Yuki. I've been right about Carlos Sainz. And I think I'm right about George Russell. I don't think he's going to win a world championship in his career. Unless, somehow, Mercedes comes up with a rocket ship in the future. Which I don't think they will. Because I think they're on the decline because remember, there's only you only had that window in Formula One. Look at Ferrari. Look at McLaren. Look at Williams. Look at all the great teams. They had that window. They win, win, they win. And then all of a sudden, the regulations change. They're behind the eight ball. The drivers change. And the next thing you know, they're mid-pack. And I, like, I, like I said last week, Mercedes is a midfield team. They have to just be happy with being midfield and trying to be the best of the midfield. They're not at the front anymore. They've gotten the package wrong three years in a row and just understand that, okay, this is where we are now. Let's make the best of where we're at now. We'll try to get back to the the front, but until then, let's make sure at least we maximize our positions race to race, which they don't do because they still think they're a front runner. They're not. Now, moving on, let's talk about the others. Well, actually, we should talk about Fernando Alonso signing a lifetime deal. What do you think about that, PJ? To me, it came as a bit of a surprise because there was all this, like these rumors and buzz around him going to Red Bull or going to uh, Mercedes. And I was like, oh, you're for sure he's in his, he's going to just go for it one last time before he retires. Like, just roll the dice again as he always does and go for, you know, a seat at Mercedes or Red Bull. But no, that didn't happen. He signed a two-year extension to his Aston Martin contract and a lifetime deal as a you know advisor, like Nicky Lauda, for when he retires. I think personally that was a good move by Fernando. One, he said something that was very poignant. He said, "Why would I go to Mercedes? We're ahead of them already," which made sense to me. I was like, well, "Yeah, why would you go to a team that was an also ran?" I'm gonna, you know, I'm not piling on our Mercedes by any for all our Mercedes fans out there. I'm not piling on Mercedes at all. I'm just talking about the reality. The reality is Aston Martin right now 
have a more developed car. The car looks better on the straight. The car is faster on the straight and they're a customer team and they got the aero package right. So it corners better. It has more grip. It's just a better car than a Mercedes is right now. And so yeah. go ahead. Aaron's better than these two. What say that again? And the, the, the McLaren is also better than the Mercedes. The Mercedes is only better than the Williams if we're talking about customer customer teams, which is just pathetic by Mercedes standards. But yeah, I mean, it, it, Fernando, I think for once he just said, "I'm not going to switch. I'm not going to go out and chase, you know, the dragon. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. They, they treat me well here. There's no controversy." I know Lance Stroll's not ha- has any chance of beating me at any point. <laughs> if I had an off day, I could still beat Lance. And why? Well, you know, I'm comfortable. And I think there's something to be said about that. So good for him. I'm glad Fernando's staying at Aston Martin. I hope maybe with the regulations change and Honda comes aboard because I heard he he mended the fences with Honda. Maybe he has a chance at winning a world championship. That would be awesome. I I don't it think so. Be, but, uh, that we would need be to awesome. talk about we need to talk about the stroll in the room, the the issue here oh, because God. this like to me this could open up the possibility of an absolute insane driver lineup. Okay, we have Science and Alonso double Spanish lineup and two of the best talents on the grid. That would make. Aston Martin an instant contender for the constructors in 26 in my opinion like but when you have Stroll there it, it instantly makes them like third or fourth you know yeah. and then and then also this also opens the door for a Yuki Alonso partnership which would also be absolute t- terror of a driver lineup that'd be just insane right but we, we're just stuck with Lance Stroll who actively brings the team down two or three places every year in the constructors I did a short on 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 this same subject. I just think that he's the one holding them back. And it's it's hard for a father to tell his son, like, because he basically bought the damn team just for his son so his son could race. But maybe it's time for Lance Stroll. To, he should be at Haas or Williams or somewhere else and bring whatever money you can bring as a paid driver and let him go race there and be on his own away from daddy's overshadow because if you really want Aston Martin to be all it can be and it could be a challenge for a constructor's title or at least second or third you got to bring in a better driver you just got to do it and Lance ain't it he he ain't he ain't he ain't it ain't gonna change he ain't gonna wake up one day and all of a sudden he's P3, P4 on, in qualifying. It's just not gonna happen. We've seen he's had enough time in Formula One to see who he is. He's a, I don't really wanna, oh, I guess. He's a below average Formula One driver who every once in a while gets a little rain in his hair and does okay. But on average, he's below average. And who do I, who's the metric? Who do you think is the metric? When you look at the grid, PJ, who's the metric for the average good Formula One driver? Not great, but Ooh, that's, good. That's Give me that. Question. Oh, okay. So for me, okay, so it's got to be middle of the road, right? Average. Average. Middle of the road, just a good, solid Formula One driver. He's not great. Good He's not an all time great, right? but just good. Alex Albon. That's that's my answer. Okay, so I would say the only thing about Alex is I think he's better in qualifying. He's a good qualifier. He's faster than I think the average Formula One driver. When I think of the average Formula One driver, I think of Kevin Magnuson. I was going to say that as my second answer. Oh, okay, that's that's yeah, what I think Kevin, of. Go ahead. The reason why I put him as number as my average is because he like has a little bit of a tendency to crash a lot but that other than that he's bone like right in the middle yes he's 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 not the greatest of qual he's a solid qualifier but he's not hulkenberg who's a exceptional qualifier and i think albon is an exceptional qualifier i think he's faster than the average formula one driver would be but magnuson he's middle of the road 
He's going to be solid. You give him a good car. He's going to perform. He is he going to win a race in a house? Of course not. But can he score a point? Yeah. The strategy has to go right. You have to give him the right setup or he has to pick the right setup and he'll get you there. He's not going to make stupid mistakes he did when he was younger, but as an average Formula One driver, that's Kevin Magnuson. Like a guy who could have a 10-year career. I mean, I think he's close to 10 years now already in Formula One, right? Yes, he had he had 10 years last year. No, wait, wait, wait. This year, because he had he had a year out because of Maz's, Maz's 10 year, so. Right. So this is, his ten- this is his 10th year. So 10 years, that I, I'd say... That's he's an average Formula One. That's that's the picture I have in my head when you say who's an average Formula One driver. Good, but not great. Kevin Magnussen. And I think Alex Albon has the capacity to be better than average only because he can qualify his ass off. He's a good qualifier. He outperforms that Williams car year after year. And he's even outperforming it now because I don't think it's a good package this year compared to last year. But I think he's just a, a. If he had a better car, just like he did last year, he'll show you what he could do, and I think he would be faster than Kevin. If they're in the same car, he's definitely faster than Kevin Magnussen. That's why I say he's better than average Albon. Yeah, and for me, also like um, Gasly and Alcon are above average. Like I was thinking about them, but since they both want to race, I can't put them at average. So that's that's why I have them like above average. Who else on the grid would you say is solid? See that it's such that's such a hard question to kind of formulate in, in your brain. You're like, okay, well, Checo. Like, I think Checo is a, a good, solid Formula One driver. Is he better than average? Nah. Throughout the history of Formula One, he's on. He has a good car, and he he's in a good team. Remember, he just, before he came to Red Bull, he had just won his first race, and it took him, what, like nine or ten years to win his first race. So that's average, right? He's an average. I think Checo is an average Formula One driver. Why do I say that? He might be a little bit better defensively than most drivers, so I guess that would eke him past being average. That 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 would be his strong suit, his his defensive capabilities, which I think are extraordinary. So that would, I guess that puts him out of the average category. What do you think about that, PJ? I think Checo is definitely above average. For me, he's like, this may sound crazy to some people. For me, he's on the level of like Oscar Fiastri. Like to me, those two are really close. Oscar is, you know, really young, but Checo is, you know, really experienced. But I think, Oscar has a lot of you know a lot of room to grow, whereas Checo has reached his full potential. But I think they're they're level right now, in my opinion. Hmm. I like that. I like I like yeah. Okay, I can see that. Now we're gonna move off of that. We're gonna talk about the other side of Formula One, and this this podcast or this episode is going a little long, only because we have a lot to talk about, and not only that. PJ's bringing in some really good takes that we haven't like delved delved in on or we haven't heard people talk about. So I like where this is going. So we're going to continue. The other side of Formula One. Remember, we were talking about Alpine earlier and how a dog of a car that Alpine is. And basically, we kind of concluded that it came down to continuity and that there's too many changes. And with too many changes in personnel, you can't have continuity. And if you can't have continuity, then you can't get consistency. Okay, another thing. The Alpine car is 11 kg or kilograms overweight. Now, with 11 kilograms overweight, that correlates to 2 kilograms correlates to 6 hundredths of a second in race pace. So if you take two kilograms, it equals six hundredths. Two times six is 30 hundredths. So that and a 10 hundredths is one second. So that's three seconds a lap that Alpine is missing because their car is too heavy. That blows my mind but like if, if i were all kind of guys i would race in my underwear just to like try to offset that weight that weight difference you know 
(laughs) (laughs) And they're French, you know, nobody would, no one would say anything. They'd be like, oh, wee wee, that's fine. (laughs) Also, yeah, just go helmet and then bam, we offset that waste. Wait. Take out the drinking water. You don't need to drink water. Hey, water's a privilege. (laughs) Also, the car has bad traction. It's very slippery on the corner, so that means it definitely doesn't have the grip that the other cars when it, when it was going around Suzuka. You have that first, you have the very long straight, and then you have a sweeping. The first turn is like almost like a a U. Well, it is a U. It's not almost. It is a. It's a big U. And the Alpine car just doesn't have the grip that the other cars do. Not even the Haas. I mean, not not even the the dog of a steak F1 car. It doesn't have the grip that these other cars do. And the engine, I mean, do we have to even talk about that Renault engine, PJ? What is wrong with that damn engine? The engine doesn't make any enough horsepower. It's it's they even tried to uh, introduce a new like like a new rule to the FIA where all the other engines would have to be capped at the horsepower level that they're at, which is pathetic. Like, why would you? You're admitting that your engine sucks by doing that. And remember, that's remember Red Bull had all these problems with Renault, and that's why they got rid of Renault and went to Honda because they just couldn't. They're just like there's just too many issues with this engine. So, what does Renault need to do to make their engines better? And why haven't they made it better? I mean, they've been in the sport forever. Why can't they deliver a decent engine? I mean, what's the problem? The problem is that they're French. They build. It's just they. If you look at it, like Renault cars, are just, they're just unreliable. You know what I mean? Like the thing is, like Italian engines, they're unreliable, but at least they're fast. And obviously, German and Japanese engines are reliable and fast, which is why they've been so good. But Ferrari has fixed their liability issues somehow, which is great. But Renault just for some reason they just don't have the R&D or the money or for whatever they, they haven't figured out how to make more horsepower and make the motor reliable because it's currently not making horsepower and it's unreliable which is just the worst combination which is crazy because remember when Honda first came in and Alonso was like this is a GP2 engine and but they got better they worked at it they're like well we've been in the sport before we got to make these changes and the Honda engine is probably obviously it's the fastest engine on the grid right now. So they went from being the worst engine to what, four or five years later being the best engine. Renault's been in the sport since time in the immortal and the engine's yeah, not so getting any better. Renault's been in the sport since the seventies. Like Honda has been in the sport longer, but like, They've been in the sport for like a, around the same amount of time because Honda's always in and out of the sport, but so is Renault. But they both have tons of experience. But Renault consistently over their entire history has had reliability issues, where Honda only had that one bad period with you know Fernando and the GP2 engine. Like as you go back to the Senna days, they're like the, by far the best, and then now here they are again with just insane reliability and you know the most amount of horsepower. So. Renault needs to figure out they should just forget the horsepower for now. Just figure out how to make the motor more reliable. Just do that first. Do that's that what, first. That's what need to figure. And with this overweight situation, how do you not how can all the other manufacturers have a part and then your part weighs more? I mean, they got 3D printing, man. I mean, how hard is this? It just it's all carbon fiber. What is your carbon fiber heavier than your carbon fiber? It has to go to the weight of the engine. And the damn engine's too heavy. It also has to go to the weight of the floor. I mean, getting your car underweight is not brain surgery. You, de- you weigh the damn car. You have testing. You know what parts are heavy and you fix it. I don't know why this is so hard to make, make the car lighter. I, it just doesn't make sense to me at all. This is Formula One. You know how many technicians and engineers they have just making a damn wing? Come on, man. It's absurd. Yeah, it brings back the question of continuity because like their their aero department must have had, I don't know how many different people in and out of there. That's another issue. 
because that's why the car doesn't have traction. The car also is overweight because probably they have like just ridiculously stupid aero designs that are probably too big or too heavy. So that's another problem that they're facing. Yeah, I, I agree. So awful, 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 awful. We're, we're, we're tired of talking about Alpine. Let's move to James Voles. Came to Williams. He came to Williams in January 23, as we all remember. They finished P7 his first year. And now it's just like the Williams of old. I mean, they don't have an extra tub. They didn't have, which Mike couldn't believe. I can't believe it. How do you not have an extra tub? But James Vold also came up and said their equipment was 20 years out of date, meaning that they were still using Excel spreadsheets to find out where parts were and how they kept parts. Now, we all know if you know anything about shipping, they have specific software just for shipping. So they can actually trace a damn nut that they made in China with a serial number and tell you where that damn nut is at any moment through the supply chain. But Williams didn't have all that. And the sad thing about it, this is the dirty side of the cost cap. Now, Williams wants to improve their systems, but every system that they improve other than the wind tunnel, because the wind tunnel is exempt. Other than the wind tunnel and the software that goes with the wind tunnel, that's all exempt. But everything else goes toward the cost cap. Not building a new facility, but the parts that go inside the facility that you have to use to make the car run. So they had asked for the FIA and they also asked for their fellow constructors like, hey, can we change this? Can you give us an exemption just for this year so we can upgrade some of our, you know, software and computers and equipment so we can be more in line with the rest of the grid of course everybody else said go fly kite no you can't do that <laughs> did you know about that pj no I, it's, this this is just painful because like the, the whole reason why williams is like this is because they struggled so bad you know a couple of five six seven years ago they couldn't afford, especially under you know the old management, they couldn't afford to buy new equipment and they just had to use the old stuff forever. And now they, they've been using that stuff for so long and they couldn't afford to get new stuff. So then now they're in the cost cap, but they now can't afford, you know, buy the rules to upgrade when now they have the capital and the money to do so. It's just, it just, it sucks. And it's all because they struggled for so long that they're, they're stuck in this situation. Yeah, and it's that's something that doesn't amend itself overnight. It's going to take some time for them to be able to upgrade one equipment with the cost cap and then have to do it the next year and then upgrade this equipment. They can't do it all at once because then they're going to be over the cap and because you got to pay personnel and you got to make sure the car runs. And now all this, obviously, they have to build another car chassis because you know logan Sargent crashed and then now alex alban had his crash and i heard they had to take that car back to uh back um back to england and had to be repaired and they're i think they're over from what at last i read they're already over like two million dollars on car parts or you know having to fix the car mostly because the two clashes that logan had but then now with this Al alex alban crash in the first lap, you know, they're spending all this money on replacing cars. They still got to upgrade parts in their factory. So they're really behind the eight ball. And this goes to show you that it's just not about building the car, designing a car and putting it on the track. You got to have the systems in place to not only design that car, but the parts you got to know, you got to be able to get parts to your car in a timely manner and have spare parts and then know where those parts are. He, he, I remember one interview, he said, we don't even know where the part is. Like they wanted to order a part. They needed a part after Logan Sargent crashed the car. They didn't even know where the part was. They couldn't find the part, PJ. They're using Excel spreadsheets. Like you said, we have no idea where things are at. But another thing is, Maybe if Logan Sargent wasn't wasn't crashing and causing two point five million dollars of the damage each crash, they could afford 
to actually upgrade some of their machines and equipment inside the cost cap, but no, they're too busy fixing, you know, five million dollars of damage of car damage caused by Logan being Logan. I wonder if, because you know he comes from money, and I wonder if his dad has to pay for that. Like, I wonder if they go to him and say, "Look, like I, we know you're helping." you know, money to get your son a seat, but he keeps crashing the cars. I'm like, you got to pay for this. Like, we can't, we can't keep continuing down this road to every time, you know, something happens, this guy crashes the car and then we got to pay for it. Like, this is like, we got to get a better driver in here. And I'm wondering, and I heard they've already started like the quiet search uh, for another driver, but I'm wondering why don't they just get Liam Lawson, put him in the seat, and just be done with it. I think that Liam Lawson is going to get Ricardo's seat by, by like the summer break or earlier if Ricardo doesn't pick up his pace. But there's got to be there's other guys out there that deserve like Dragovic. There's other F two winners that are sitting, you know, in the simulator for teams. A lot of these guys got to be better than Logan Sargent. And the reason why I say that is because remember Logan didn't win F2. He didn't, he wasn't second. He wasn't third. I think he was like maybe fifth in F2 in the final standings when he, when he raced in F2, there's a lot of F2 winners doing simulator work on the grid. Give one of those guys a shot because there's all kinds of people. They all have to have a better shot than Logan is doing. I mean, they all have to be better than him. Don't you think? Yeah, I'd say even just put Kimi Antonelli in there already. And just like go for it, because like Mercedes want him in, in, in F one, so just put him in. Just put him in Williams this year. Because he'd have to be better than Logan, right? I mean, just anybody has to yeah. be better. Even if he's the same, it's not like they're. It's not like they lost their. You know, lost anything really. It's like, but uh, he's he's got to be better than Logan because Logan's just really bad right now and i and, and then, I, I think it's also his psych his psychology you know his psych can't be that great you know he keeps crashing he's not doing that well he's not getting good results you know maybe he's a paper reader he's reading the paper and in grove they're probably killing him you know in england you know the england tabloids are way worse than american tabloids so they're probably just killing this guy over there and i hope he doesn't read or listen to what people are saying because that's just going to further throw him over the edge yeah, and the team has zero confidence in him. He at least he feels that way because they took his chassis and gave it to Albon when he did nothing wrong in Australia. Yeah. So that that killed his confidence for sure. Let's move on. But then, Let's, oh, oh, keep yeah, going. Don't know. No, f- f- finish your point, PJ. Sorry. Yeah. Then he, I just when he when he just absolutely destroyed the car in Japan, I was like, holy shit, really? Like, dude. I mean, I was like. Come on, this is why they didn't give you the car because look what you just did. You just that was so disappointing to me to, for me to see. And you were there live, so you saw it. He's just not that good. I'm sorry. I, I, I hate. I I want everybody in Formula One to succeed. I want every driver to be the best that they can be to reach their potential. But. The sad reality is Formula One is a ruthless business and they will cut you like nobody's, you know, bad haircut. And it's just time for him. I don't think they need to give him more time. We've seen what he is. He is what he is. We'll see more of it this weekend. And if he has a bad weekend, if it was me on Monday morning, he'd be gone. Period. End of story. Let's move on. I'd be like, that's enough. We've seen it. We know what the story is. Thank you. I think go to IndyCar. I think Mick Schumacher would even be a better choice than him right now. Oof. Yeah. At least you'd sell some merchandise, you know. But yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Let's move on to what you want to talk about. When we talk about the other side of Formula One, we're going to give you more glimpses. And we talked about Alpine. We talked about Williams. Now let's talk about. Haas. Did you know Haas is headquartered in the United States? Their design office is in Italy. Their factory 
for racing is in the UK. <laughs> so Italy does the design and aero. The UK does the race engineers and car performance. And so they have the engineers for race day and, you know, race weekend. How can that work? And the first thing the new principal did was say, well, we need better communication, you know, because we have all these different parts and all these different factories and all these different people in different places. They weren't even communicating. No wonder the house was a mess. No wonder uh, Gene um, uh, Gunther Steiner had said, I should have left this place a long time ago. No wonder. Because no, no, no. Just think about this, PJ. Okay. We're designing. Let's let's keep it simple. We're designing a bicycle. Okay. We have a bike design. You and we have a bike race team. You take care of the arrow. Okay. And the design. And you're where you live. And I live in Canada. And I'm taking care of, you know, uh, team tactics, um, team uh, nutrition, uh, team travel and all that. Then we have another person who's taking care of the logistics of getting the equipment. And then we have another person who's taking care of the parts and all that. And all of us live in different continents. How do you think that works, PJ? There would be no communication and the finished product would be like unrelated to each other. It'd just be so different from what one person wants it to be because everyone has different ideas of what it should be. It makes so much sense. That's why it's so much easier to have one big factory. If I have an issue or I'm working on something, I can just go down to the third floor and see PJ and see what he's working on and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. How does that connect with what you're doing? And we can have meetings between departments every day in the morning and then go off into our own department and do our, our job. Yeah, you can do that with Zoom, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Me talking to you on Zoom, you can't see the part. You can't feel it. You don't get a vibe for what I'm thinking and how I'm going. You see it on a screen. It's not the same. It's very impersonal. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, the Haas team will never, ever be a top three constructor team. Until they get that fixed. And from what I hear under Gene Haas. He's kind of a penny pincher. I mean he's probably over his head in Formula 1. I think it cost too much money. I don't think he knew the cost that were involved. His team is. He's made more money in Formula 1. Than he would ever do in any other sport. He probably should sell the team. That's probably what he should do. I think there's a couple teams that should be sold. And I think Haas is one of them. Only because of just what we've just talked about. Chime in, BJ. I think that Gunther Steiner should have been dropped actually a long time ago, considering this. And I think that the new team principal, Tomatsu, is going to have a way better job than Gunther Steiner. Like the, the, the team before this, everyone was like, oh, they're, they're fucked. They're going to be dead last. They're going to be absolute garbage. Even the team themselves are like, yeah, we're going to be last. And they show up, and then Alpine's last, and they're actually doing pretty good. They scored points. When they were, they scored double points. They didn't even think they're going to. They thought they were going to not even get a single point this year. But here they are. I think they outperformed their expectations. I think he's a big thing. He's a big part of the reason why they're doing so well. Is the new team principal? One hundred percent. He's Jap. Not. I'm not going to say just because he's Japanese. But there's an order to things. And he knew, like, the, he was the number two guy. And he could see the holes. And he fixed them. You know, or he's attempting to fix them. And he's on the way to making it better. You can already see the performance of the cars better. You can already see that the drivers probably are a little bit happier. Because he probably has a different style than Gunther does. And I think it was a great choice. I just think that. They need to spend, you know, get, they got to spend more. You want to win in Formula One? You got to spend the money. You got to get. Right. You, also, go ahead. The team, the team is running more efficiently. Also, like the pit stops, the strategy, reliability. 
you know, it's like it's it's running as a well-oiled machine or it's getting there. But now the, the biggest issue is Gene not being able, not willing to spend the money to improve, to improve the facilities of the team. That's the biggest issue now. Yes. They, now that they're taking another step forward, if they want to take another step forward and be in the front of the midfield, they're going to have to spend the money. That's the only way you get it. That's the only way you can get up to the front of the grid you got to spend the money you have to have that factory backing and backbone that's reliable that's consistent and that people want to go and work for because all the top teams steal from each other right everyone's stealing from Merck right now right everyone's stealing from Mercedes and everyone's going to Ferrari and then Red Bull stole from Mercedes, and now McLaren's stealing from here and there. Haas can't steal from anybody. Who's Haas going to steal from? Alpine? You know, who's Haas stealing from? Steak F1? You know, no one from Mercedes is going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go work for Haas. No, because one, they're not going to get more money. They'll get more responsibility, but it's all about worth, and it's all about making that next step up. And you're not going to go backwards. You always want to go forwards. And so Haas would be a step backwards for many of the top people. Wouldn't you say, PJ? Well, yeah, because Haas still, they're the least, like, they're the least amount of money on the grid for sure. So most of these engineers and, you know, these aero guys, is like that. they want more money when they move teams they're just going to get a lot less, like, but they're going to get a bigger role, but still they're going to get a lot less money. That's what they want. Now that we talked about Haas, let's get into the let's get into the gorilla in the room. The Mercedes car is probably the worst. Is this the worst iteration of these last three years? No, because it doesn't have the porpoising. They have new side pods. They have they went to um, like a shape like a push rod rear suspension. Okay, they moved the cockpit 10 centimeters back. They have changes in the front wing. They have changes in the rear wing. Now, when they put this new car in the wind tunnel, the simulator showed with the sensors and the pressure tabs that they have that the downforce levels were 70 points more. 70 points more downforce, which should translate into more speed. Faster cornering, better grip and handling. But it hasn't translated onto the track because they finished seventh and ninth in Suzuka, PJ. Man, Mercedes, dude, I, when I watched that shit live, I was like, what the fuck are you doing? That strategy was so bad. And Lewis was saying, like, what the fuck are we doing, man? Like, this is terrible. And they're like, oh, Lewis, just stick to it. I'm like, no, you need to come in and change the strategy. And they they just, I don't know why they're so confident in their dog shit strategy when Lewis clearly, he knows better because he's Lewis and they didn't listen to him. They kept him out. I mean, I talked about this uh, last, last week from the track because I was at the track. They kept him out on those damn tires too long. Okay. They kept yeah. him out. On the first stint, he was out probably two to three laps too long. Then on the second stint, <laughs> they didn't leave him out long enough. Like, why are you changing the tires? You're on hard tires. There's only this many laps left. He He's doing good. What are you bringing him in for? It, it didn't make any sense. And they used up the damn mediums in practice. <laughs> and they needed the, the mediums work better for the race, but they only had a hard because they used up all the mediums. <laughs> Just the and, yeah. the, and then even furthermore, it was six degrees Celsius more hotter on race day. And that six degrees affected the car like it was a, a, a beaten wet mop. It couldn't it, it dramatically affected the car compared to practice one, two and three, just because it was six degrees hotter. I just don't know. They, yeah, they, they reminded me a lot of 
Ferrari like strategy when I saw that. Like, well, Ferrari's gotten better, but like, you know, the Ferrari of old, they just echoed Ferrari of, you know, yesteryear. When I saw that, I was like, what? They were just like Ferrari. They were terrible strategy, and the team was confident, and then they had their, you know, in house strategist driver, like Sciences for Ferrari, where Lewis is for Mercedes, the you know, voice is concerned. And they, the team's still confident that, oh, we're, we're doing the right thing, but no, it just totally threw it away. Threw it away. And it's not going to get any better. I mean, they're not winning. I don't think Mercedes is going to win a race this year. I don't, I don't think so. I don't see it happening. The only way they win a race is if both Red Bull's DNF, both Ferrari's DNF, there's a crash that... Like takes out all the top cars. There's just I just don't see it. Now they could they could have a dramatic change like McLaren did mid season like last year, but that's still not going to win them a race. That'll probably get them a third, maybe get them a podium. But I can't see them winning one race this year. I can't even see right now. I can't even see them on the podium. It could happen later in the season, but right now for this race upcoming. At the Shanghai International Circuit, they're not going to be on the podium. Yeah, this this is how I see Mercedes going in the future. I see this year. I don't. I think they're just going to be a midfield team, like you said, just fighting for fifth and fourth and sixth. You know, average. Next year, I think they're going to be like podium contenders, maybe a win here and there and i think that science will be at, at mercedes next year that's my person that's my feeling and then i think he'll be there for 26 as well and i think that by 26 they'll hopefully i feel like they will ever act together and they'll be able to challenge for wins consistently in 26 that's that's how i feel like the team is going yeah i think i i kind of agree with that i agree with C- carlo uh, science should go to mercedes for the year and Matter of fact, I, I said it before the season started. Carlos Sainz, well, should go to Mercedes, and then Mercedes and Ferrari should swap right there. As soon as they sign Carlos Sainz to a contract, they should swap and let Lewis go on to Ferrari and finish the season at Ferrari, and let Carlos come in early to Mercedes and get his feet wet at Mercedes. I think that would be the best thing to happen for the grid. That would be the best thing to happen for the fans. That would give us some actual exciting racing because now we got Lewis back up at the front and then Carlos Sainz can get his feet wet with whatever that is going on over at Mercedes but as far as the new regs go I've heard that not only they're talking about they might want to extend these old regs for a year because these new regs the cars are they can't even (laughs) I heard in the testing, cars were just going off for no reason at all. Like the arrow and the engines just aren't mixing at all. Like the arrow's throwing the the car out of whack. People said it's hard to control. Then also, Adrian Newey said he doesn't even understand why they're doing these new rigs because the object of Formula One, really, the technology is eventually, that's why they have all these big car manufacturers, is because eventually they're going to bring that technology to your car, okay? Some of the technologies are going to show up in cars eventually. And he was saying that the recovery system with this new electrical the electrical batteries 5050 coming up in the new regs and he said that it was always on full power even when you took slow turns, the slowest turns which is in Monaco, that big uh that left turn that they make, that's the slowest turn in the Formula One calendar. And he said, even when they took that turn, it was still full power from the electrical battery. He said, so there's no way that that's ever going to show up in a car that people drive. So he said, since that's not going to happen, why are we pursuing this? Did you hear that one, PJ? I did not, but I I did hear that the Formula the new Formula One regulations are, are going to be slower than current Formula Two. I, I heard that. Stop it with the sustainability. Okay. Yeah. Let's go back it. to V10. Go back to V10s and V8s. Just yeah. Just stop it. Why do we have to be sustainable? 
It's a farce. These damn electric batteries are worse than your petrol car for the environment. To make it with the cobalt and all that, that's worse for the environment than a regular car is to make. A regular gas-driven car is safer for the environment than an electric car. Because to make the electric car, the parts that they need to make these batteries are worse for their environment. So why are we doing it? Why are we doing also, it? Also, Formula One, I've been telling this to people a lot lately because they they came out with that 100% fucking green fuel that's <laughs> just a gas gasoline substitute that they haven't released yet. But you remember they, they tested it and everything at Silverstone in like 2022. Remember, they, it's like the carbon neutral fuel. It's just a gas substitute where it works in everything. Old cars, new cars, one of the one cars, race cars, right? It, and what's the, they even said like Ross Braun, you know, he was asked like, oh, if you guys, you guys came out this new fuel, it works in everything. Why not bring back V10s? And he said, oh, the only reason that we're not doing that is because the new car companies aren't interested in V10s. They're more interested, they're interested in hybrids and electric cars and, you know, crap. But he said that if they, if they could do that, bring back V10s and uh, new car companies would join, they would do it. Which is strange. And I'll tell you why it's strange. They don't care about that crap in NASCAR, bro. They don't care about no, that. They don't. they don't care about that crap in IndyCar, bro. They don't care about that crap in GT car, bro. They don't care about that crap in pretty much any other racing series, except that stupid Formula E. Nobody else cares. So why does Formula One have to care? That's my thing. Why do they care about it? What, what is the big push to sustain a belt? Why? No one else cares in all these other motorsports. Why do you care? The big thing is that if they're, if, okay, they can, if, let's say they care, but then they came out with this fuel that's 100%, you know, doesn't produce any emissions. Since you, there you go, you have it. Then just go full bore back to V10s and that are 100% green. And then that, there you go. You're sustainable and you bring back the sound and the excitement that we want. So a win-win. 100%. Not only is it a win-win, the fans are happier. The constructors are happier because it, I heard that this car, so the whole point of changing the regulations is so the cost can come down the cost i hear is going to go up because these damn (laughs) the damn hybrid engine is so complicated to make they're making it more complicated who's working at the fia and why are they working there and why aren't we firing these people because it doesn't make sense like where's the common sense you, oh, you just pointed it out, PJ. You just said that they come up with a fuel that's going to be sustainable, that's going to be better for the environment. So if they've come up with this fuel, let's get back to the V8s. Let's get back to the V8s. Because V10s, okay, manufacturers don't want to make V10s. I mean, they had it in the Viper. They don't have many cars running out there with V10s. But there's still a lot of cars with V8s. I'll even take a V6. Yeah, I'll even take a V6. Tons. You know, yeah, but the thing is, like, everyone's so brainwashed electric cars too. Um, because I, I tell people about this, I remember telling one of my coworkers like last year that Formula One was coming out with this fuel, and like, it was going to be available to the public soon after. And they're like, "What? Like, I never heard about that. Like, I'm gonna have to. I want to buy an electric car in the future." I'm like, "No, you can just buy whatever you want, drive whatever you want, because this fuel is going to be out." So I think that's the only one needs to do a better job of marketing this field. I feel like once the public knows, like the full public knows about it, electric car sales are going to never, never, they're just never going to recover. They're going to go straight down the toilet where they belong. Not only that, but did you know a lot of the manufacturers, like a lot of these companies were going to go full EV? Honda stopped it. They're like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're going to make more hybrids. We're not going full electric. A lot of the companies are finding out one, people don't want full electric cars. Why? Because the grid's not sustainable. They haven't built up the grid to handle all the electric cars. Two, they get tired of sitting around some some place waiting for the car to charge. Like, I got to go charge until they got to make time in their life 
to charge the car. If they don't charge at home, they got to charge at work. If they're taking a trip, they got to find a, a charging station. Then they got to sit around for a half an hour, 40 minutes. And then they say, oh, the fast charger, it's only 10 minutes. But then what do they find out? Well, the more they use the fast charger, the longer it takes for the car to charge up. Then what else do they find out? Well, the car at first used to get 280 miles when I charge. Now, as I use it, now I'm getting 270. Now I get 260. And the longer you have the life of the car, the shorter miles it's going to be able to go. So there's a lot of things that they sell you when you first get it. But then the reality is the longer you have it, the worse it's going to get. But I can always go down to the gas station and fill up the car. It takes five minutes. That's why I think the sustainable fuel is the way to go. I think it definitely is. And to be honest, I heard and I delve into this stuff because I, I nerd out on Formula One stuff. Hydrogen for cars are it, what makes it better for the environment because then the byproducts just water. Okay, and a hydrogen is everywhere. You can get hydrogen. It's you know if we have hydrogen, you can get hydrogen all over. You can make the damn engine can make hydrogen almost. So electric cars not going to be the go to car for the future. They're going to come up with something else because the manufacturers and the environmentalists know that this the electric battery is worse for the environment. Not only that, but I, I don't know if people go in and look at YouTube and see how they make these cobalt batteries. It's in the Congo. They have these poor eight year old and 10 year old kids mining this stuff with no mass. They're basically butt naked. They have shorts on and they're mining a toxic chemical out of the ground with nothing and there's hundreds of thousands of all these kids and adults and moms with babies and you could see it it's right on the dam they did a documentary on it and yeah this is- I, I saw that it's horrid it's just like they're, they're mining lithium and cobalt in these holes in the jungle and it's just absolutely horrible kids babies and so like when, fam- when you see Johnny Q public walking around driving his Tesla saying, oh, I'm doing so great for the environment. No, you're not. You're worse than me driving my damn SUV. So don't give me this crap. You're not better. You're not doing anything for the environment. If you had any social conscience at all, you wouldn't drive that car because you know where they get the materials from you know that there's some mom in the congo who's pregnant who's mining this stuff and breathing all this stuff in and who's going to get cancer and not even live to 28 that put that in your damn social oh uh, i'm i'm good for the environment drink coffee smoke and smoke that because you're worse off than the person driving the v10 or the f-150 truck you worse off for the environment and as a person you should find out where that stuff comes from and you should be appalled i'm sorry about that pj i just it just really it just pisses me off Well, like you said, though, the good thing is, is a lot of companies are reversing their EV only policy. You know, Honda, uh, Toyota, uh, GM just did that, but Ford, Ford never had an EV policy, which is going to, they've said that they're going to, they're never going to stop making the V8 Mustang, which is great. And uh, Porsche, another one, BMW, it's just a lot of these companies are like, screw that, which we're going to keep making what we've been making. So then why why can't Formula One just just chin up, man, and, and get back to the let's go racing, let's make loud cars, nice gas guzzling noise. Oh, we'll use this new sustainable fuel, but we're going to go back to making the engine simple so all the manufacturers can make a V8. We'll use this new fuel and everyone will be happy. Yeah, they, they ran the fuel in, um, I think, Sebastian Vettel, you know, how he's all about sustainability. But he, at Silverstone 2022, he ran the fuel that they, he, they tested it in the Williams, Nigel Mansell's championship winning Williams, and then they two Williams. And it ran just as good as it would on any race fuel. So 
So there's the there answer. There's the answer. Yeah. There it is. We want to thank everyone for our tuning in to our Shanghai preview for the Formula One race this weekend. Remember, it's a sprint race. We want to re- remind everyone out there to like, subscribe, and comment on our channel. We have we're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple, we are on Amazon. We also have an Instagram and a um, Twitter account, and we also have a TikTok account. So look for us, America F1. That's M E R I C A F1. We also have our co sponsor, which is. <laughs> Go ahead, PJ. <laughs> say, say it. Wait, co sponsor? Yeah, say it. Say it. Oh, OnlyFans? No, Doobie. No. Doobie. PJ, I don't, I don't even get it right. Sponsor. Oh, you didn't know. So, Doobie Energy Drinks. Doobie Energy Drinks gives you not only more energy, but more focus. And it's more fun. So, go get your Doobie Energy Drink. Use the code AmericaF1, M E R I C A F1, for your discount. And right now, they're running a promotion where you can get 30% off. Of the Doobie Energy Drink, then you put in our code and then you get more of a discount. Why pay full price when you can get your Doobie Energy Drink at a discount? That's Doobie Energy Drink, America F1, M E R I C A F1. Thanks everybody for tuning in for another episode. This has been our longest episode to date. And we'll see you after the race next week. We also have a special episode. Me and PJ went down to Sonoma and we watched. Go ahead, PJ. Tell them what we did. Yes, we went to Sonoma and interviewed Alex Vogel of OnlyFans AMG Mercedes Racing. We got a nice interview of him coming out soon. Yeah, we're going to. Do that on the break. There's a break before Miami. I think it's two weeks. And we're going to put that episode out with Alex Fogo of OnlyFans Racing. And that's with the AMG Mercedes Benz Racing Team. Thank you for tuning in. And everyone, keep on. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Racing, everybody. I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing.